One of the things that I think is, is, is really interesting that's come up today a lot is, um, so this conference this day is about mindfulness, but we've also spent a lot of the time talking about compassion and love and kindness. And uh, sometimes a question might arise, well, how do these two things connect? What's the relationship, you know, between mindfulness and compassion or mindfulness and love, you know? Um, and I think what's, what's interesting about mindfulness, one way of understanding mindfulness is that it's a way of paying attention. So we're really bringing attention into the here and now to connect with what's happening. And another way of thinking, a way of thinking about um, love is that love is like an act of paying attention. Like it's something I do with the, with the uh, kids a lot of the time when I'll, I'll talk to them, but if we want to be a good friend, we have to be mindful of them. We have to pay attention to them. If you know, if I was talking to Robbie and I'm like, Robbie, tell me about your day. And then I'm like, and he starts talking to me, I'm like, oh, my phone and my attention is here. I'm not being a good friend to him. And the kids get this, you know, because they've had all this experience of, of um, talking to adults and adults aren't listening to them. They're not paying attention to them, you know. So sometimes I think the word love or kindness and compassion can, can seem like this kind of, un, like this kind of um, unachievable goal or this kind of grand esoteric like you know it means so many things but actually you know it's quite simple quite down to earth there's a researcher called um, Barbara Fredrickson uh, she's, and she's a researcher at the University of uh, Chapel Hill in North Carolina and she has done a lot of research on positive emotions the effect of positive emotions in the last few years she's turned her attention about how positive emotions arise between people and among people. And the way she defines love is any moment, any micro moment of mutually shared positive emotion. So anytime you share a joke with somebody, anytime you, you share an interest or you're kind of connecting with somebody in some way, like in a very real way, the, the kind of activity of these two people's brains start to kind of sync up and mirror, you know? So this is, when we talk about connection, this is what it's about and what's key, what she has found in her research is key to this connection is eye contact. She's like, if there's no eye contact, there's not that same level of connection. It just doesn't happen. She's got a, a, a book out, um, the typically American, no offense guys, American title called uh, Love 2.0. But it's a great, great book, a lot of good uh, stuff on, on love and kindness practice and also some really interesting summary of the research. So when we're learning to, to pay attention and be mindful and pay attention to our own experience in a way that is, is non-judgmental and is kind, we're really learning a practice of how to like, love ourselves, how to be a good friend to ourselves, how to be kind to ourselves. And then this is what... When we do that for ourselves, it's natural that that kind of starts to turn out towards others. We open our eyes and then we see all these other human beings in this room who, you know, are vulnerable. We've got our ups and downs. We've got our crazy minds, you know. So that's, I guess, just to, that's how kind of mindfulness and, and um, this kind of relational part, this aspect of, of connecting with other people and, and being kind and, and compassionate kind of come together. So... I thought we would start with a, with a short practice just for a, a little bit before, um, after, after lunch and before I tell you about some of the, the work of youth mindfulness. Okay, so if you guys want to find a, a way of sitting that feels at ease, feels comfortable. And so one thing that's it's very helpful in, in mindfulness is to really learn to, as Lindsay was saying this morning, to really come into the body, because when we're in touch with the body, um, we're naturally more present. You know, as soon as we're paying attention to our breath, we're paying attention to the sensations in our hands, our mind is in the present moment. Whereas if we're, if we're lost in thinking, we'll find that we're not so in touch with the body. beginning with a few slightly deeper breaths. Just deepening the in-breath and becoming aware of how the breath feels in the body. Really 
bringing a sense of curiosity to what this, this thing that we call the breath is. Where do you notice the feeling of the breath? Maybe in the belly, the movement of the lungs. A subtle movement of the shoulders. Maybe noticing the flow of air around the nostrils, the mouth. Maybe also noticing if there's any difference in temperature between the in-breath and the out-breath. Gently expanding your awareness throughout the whole body. Feeling the feet, the legs, hands and arms. Contact the chair. the in-breath, if you like, we can imagine really breathing mindfulness into every cell of the body, the muscles, the limbs, but you're really filling your body with awareness. particular coming in contact with any areas of tension or tightness or holding. And then with the out breath, noticing how the body just lets go of the air in the out breath. So in the same way, maybe allowing the weight of the body to just kind of let go. Let a sense of rest arise. And then from this place of kind of being a little more embodied. We can also turn our attention to what's happening in the mind. Maybe if there's any different feelings present, different emotions. How the body feels after lunch. Just touching into a general sense of the kind of feeling tone of your experience, whether it's pleasant, unpleasant, neutral. No need to judge as good or bad, just recognizing. Also become aware of sounds coming and going. Maybe no 
noticing thoughts and mental activity. Whatever's arising, just noticing. And I've seen if it's possible to really just allow this moment to be exactly as it is. And allow yourself to be exactly as you are. Finally letting go of the effort even to pay attention. And just allowing yourself to rest with the unfolding of experience from moment to moment. Sometimes it can be nice after practice to kind of massage your face if you feel that you want to do that. Okay. So I thought I'd I thought I'd start today with uh, with a question. Um, I don't know. Sometimes I like to start with these two questions. If you've seen me before, you may have seen me ask these questions. But I think it's a nice a nice way to begin. So the first question is, what do schools teach? And um, I'd like you to try and answer this in just two words. So if you just take a moment, maybe close your eyes and think, what do schools spend most of their energy, most of their focus on? What do they mostly do? Just two words, what do schools teach? Any answers, any thoughts? Let's see a hand. Go for it. Fear. Fear, okay. <laughs> Maybe, yeah, yeah, totally. Anything else? Any other thoughts? Yeah? To comply. To comply, uh-huh. Yeah? Humiliation. Humiliation, yeah. Maybe. For the teachers or for the kids? <laughs> yeah? Life skills. Life skills, totally, totally. Any other thoughts? No. Yeah? Maths and language. Maths and language, yeah. Children. Yeah. Children. Children. <laughs> We got a smart aleck in the class here. I was gonna <laughs> get to the back. <laughs> okay. So here's another question. Okay. What do you wish for your children? And again, in two words. And if you don't have children, you could think of um, younger relatives or just children in general. What do you? So just again, taking some time. What do you most deeply wish for your children? In two words. Yeah? Happiness. Happiness, yeah. What else? Yep. Confidence. Confidence. Yeah. Honesty. Honesty. Yeah. Great thinker. Great thinker, yeah. Right at the back. Resilience. Resilience. Yeah. Peace. To love and be loved. To love and be loved, yeah. 
Opportunity? Yeah. Life purpose. Life purpose? Open hearts, cool. Yeah, right at the back, go for it. Self-worth. Self-worth, absolutely. So uh, the reason I wanted to start with these questions is, um, is suggest, maybe more than suggest, that there is a misalignment between what our education system focuses on and what we most deeply wish for our young people. Um, and it used to be the case, I used to feel that we need to do more in terms of well-being for young people, you know, we need to spend more time in that. But I'm now, I now believe that actually well-being is the fundamental purpose of education. That everything that a school should, does should be towards the end of healthy, happy lives for young people, you know. And of course, this means that we don't throw out the academic stuff, because the academic is still part of that grander purpose. You know, if kids have developed um, their skills, their, their, their knowledge, um, and they get prepared for the workforce, well, being in work, getting satisfying work, being able to develop your talents is part of well-being, you know? But I think, um, traditionally, the, the overwhelming emphasis on academia has, has, has really mean that, that that's just one element of the kind of, uh, of well-being that we focused on. And, and we've um, missed out on so much other stuff, you know. Um, you know, even, even things, simple things, like does a, does a kid know how to be a good listener, you know? Think about, like, I, I remember reading in books, you know, there's all these courses on how to be a good speaker or a public speaking, but how about actually being a good listener, you know? Does a young person know how to be authentic in a relationship, you know? Do they, have a, do they know how to touch into what they do, most deeply value? These are the questions that you know seem peripheral, but actually, we think about this is stuff is central to being able to lead life well, you know. And I think well-being is becoming more and more um, uh, uh, recognised as, as important in education. Um, but my sense is, a lot of the time, if you look at really kind of across schools across the whole country that it's, it's too often done in a kind of piecemeal way, you know? And, you know, the recommendation is like a happiness lesson once a week or something. And I, I really believe that actually we need to go back to first principles in a way and start to say, okay, so the purpose of education is well-being. That is the fundamental purpose. So if that's where we're starting from, what would the school system look like? What would our education system look like if that's really what we were kind of, um, if that's what we recognize as the key purpose of it, you know? Um, so we have this question then, what is well-being, you know, and it's, it's, a, it's, a, it's a word that we throw around a lot, so I just wanted to touch on this um, today, because uh, we, we could spend, you know, philosophers, psychologists could spend ages discussing this, you know, what is well-being, but a, a helpful way I think of understanding it is, is healthy habits of thought, feeling and action, and so this is a kind of commonsensical way to understand it, so it's it's like character strengths that we all recognize, that courage, resilience, leadership, wisdom, compassion, confidence, so on and so forth. And these are, these are qualities of, of being, these are really habits of, of, of action, of interaction, that cultures across the world value and recognize is, is, is worthwhile, you know? And what's interesting as well is there's now tons of, of um, research being done to show when people have these qualities and they express these qualities and these are really a living reality for them, it has a massive impact on their health, on their relationships, on you know, their academic performance, their workplace performance. There's so much research out there. What's interesting as well, I think to what Sahari was talking about this morning, is that for these strengths to really be expressed and to be, as I say, a living reality, they can only really be expressed in community. You know, if people are isolated, it's very hard to be kind or compassionate or, 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 you know, have opportunities to show courage or be resilient or show leadership when there's isolation, you know? So I think, I think this, is a, this is another key thing that we see that mindfulness can, can be a way to restore community, if you like. So one, one way that I, I think of, I find helpful to think of the human being and think of these qualities is they're like the processes, you know? The habits of being, and we can think of even as the human being as kind of a dynamic process. And we've got all these different levels 
We've got, you know, our, our brain, we've got a physiology, we've got thought, we've got emotion. And there's this kind of dynamic process. And the question is, can we influence this process? Can we do anything about well-being? We recognize well-being is important. Um, but can we do anything about it? And so I'd like to show you a video here um, of a, a guy uh, called, um, this is Jeffrey Schwartz. If we just hold the video for two seconds. Um, he's a psychiatrist at the University of California, Los Angeles. And uh, for a long time, a kind of deterministic understanding of the human brain held sway. And, 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 and Jeffrey Schwartz talks about this new understanding, which I think is really important and is an important kind of scientific context for mindfulness and what, what this work is all about. The big change that has occurred and is in the process of occurring now is that the era is coming to an end where the brain, represented by the bottom hand of this mock-up of a famous picture by Escher, in the era up to now, it's been the brain creates the mind. The mind is what the brain does. That is not true. That is changing. Now that top hand, the mind, by which we mean directed attention, is going to be empowered. And meetings like this are critical to the cultural change that needs to occur, that empowers our understanding of the mind to change the brain. The brain puts out the call. We all acknowledge this. The brain is the passive part of existence. The brain puts things into our consciousness. But it is the active mind that makes choices about whether to listen and how to listen. And in the process of doing that, you rewire your brain. That is the big message. OK. So this is obviously this is the finding of neuroplasticity. And, um, if you guys are not familiar, just very quickly, neuroplasticity is the finding the brain is the organ of experience. And it's constantly changing and growing and developing different connections in response to our experience. And for a long time, you know, for, for certainly most of the 20th century, scientists understood or believed that the brain didn't really change or grow. So by the time you got to about 20 years old, your brain just decayed until you died. So it's not the most optimistic, you know, <laughs> viewpoint on which to decide, okay, let's try and improve the human condition, you know, that's the way the brain is. But now we understand that the brain is constantly changing um, and responding to experience and changing its activity and, e and even its structure. Um, and this happens throughout the lifespan. They've even found the process of neurogenesis, the growth of new brain cells, and people um, well into their 80s. Um, and, and so Norman Doidge, a psychiatrist at Columbia University, says this is the single most important change and our understanding of the human brain in 400 years. So this whole, the, the kind of emergence of mindfulness is a way of bringing about well-being also arises at the kind of same time in the last 20, 30 years where we understand that what's possible for the human beings is, is, is maybe more than we thought before. Another finding that I want to touch on very, very briefly, because um, uh, it's, it's kind of beyond my, uh, beyond my pay grade, you know, it's not really within my expertise, epigenetics and molecular biology, that's why Harry, so Harry Bonds is here, you know. But what's interesting with, with epigenetics is, um, is, the, is the study of how genes express themselves. So we all have this genetic code, but whether or not a gene expresses itself um, is dependent again on our environment, our relationships, our experience. So there's a little, little thing, it's called little proteins called histones. And if they're wound tightly around the gene, then they kind of downregulate the gene. And if they're wound loosely, then the gene gets expressed itself more. And then also there's these other little molecules called methyl groups. And if they attach themselves to the gene, they kind of effectively turn the gene off, right? Or they turn it on if, they, if they're not attached to it. So even, you know, the conventional Wisdom is that, you know, if you're grumpy, your uncle was grumpy, your grandpa was grumpy, you're grumpy, it's your genes, you can't do anything about it. But now actually we see what well, even how our genes are expressed is, is subject to, to, is possible to change that, you know? And so, there's a study published last year um, and showed that mindfulness meditation caused down regulation of genes implicated in inflammation. Um, and these changes are in turn associated with faster cortisol recovery. So this is exactly the kind of, you know, um, bio-behavioral mechanisms that Sahari was talking about this morning. And uh, what's really interesting was this, this study looked at mindfulness practitioners practicing for one day, and they found this change in the way that genes express compared to control group in just one day. So the reason I wanted to touch on this was just to, to really emphasize that I think we're, we're, we're now at a point with the science where 
the notion that human beings aren't, positive, aren't capable of positive change, we can just throw that notion out. I mean, it's not, it's not a worthwhile, it's not validated, you know? I think a much healthier assumption is whenever we're working with any young people, that this person is capable of positive change. Just by the virtue of the fact that they're human beings, they've got this brain that's plastic, they've got these genes that can change the way they express, you know? So I, I, for me, this, this causes a lot of optimism. Um, so we know positive change is possible, but we still need a method. No, guess, no prizes for guessing what that method is. So uh, mindfulness. So I thought if, if you're new to mindfulness, I'd just give you a brief, brief kind of uh, history of mindfulness, a bit of the context. So this shows, shows the scientific publications in mindfulness over the last 30 years, um, year by year. So these are, these are the, the, the um, publications each year. So there's more, I think now there's maybe more than 4,000 scientific papers um, on, on mindfulness. And uh, John Kabat-Zinn started teaching uh, eight-week mindfulness courses back in the kind of late 70s and started doing research, but kind of doing it in obscurity for a long time. And then in the year 2000, uh, Oxford University published a, a randomized control trial looking at mindfulness with major depression. And they found that it cut the rate of relapse in half uh, for people who had um, three or more incidents or episodes of major depression. And these are people that really, really, really struggled to not continually relapse. But mindfulness made a big difference. And so there was a few kind of key studies and then, as you know, things just kind of took off and there's all this brain science on it now. And uh, more studies done um, every year. It's kind of tough to, tough to keep up with it all. Um, So then how do we teach, can young people learn to be mindful? Um, I wanted to talk a little bit about what is sometimes thought of as three components of mindfulness. So John Kabat-Zinn gives a definition of mindfulness as paying attention in a particular way on purpose in the present moment and uh, non-judgmentally. And so just to break this down, um, the intentional component of mindfulness refers to the fact that we do it on purpose. You might have found even in these practices this morning that sometimes the mind just wanders away here and there all the time. So mindfulness most of the time is something we actually, it's a volitional act. We have to decide to be mindful. We have to direct our attention, our attention to the present moment. Um, then of course the attentional piece is, is, is learning to pay attention to the present moment. And then the, the attitudinal piece is how we pay attention. So bringing a sense of warmth and, and kind of kindness and non-judgment. What's interesting about courses for adults is that they spend a lot of time focusing on the second two components. You know, if an adult comes to a mindfulness course and, there's, and they're struggling with chronic pain or maybe they have a uh, struggle with depression, they have a really strong intention. They're taking money out of their own pocket. They're taking time out to go to the course. So they're willing, they've got a strong motivation already. But when you walk into a classroom with 30 kids or in a jail young offenders, they have no intention at all, you know? And so adult courses don't really spend a lot of time thinking about how to uh, cultivate motivation or, 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 or kind of engage people, G generally speaking, you know. So one of the key things, and of course we saw this morning with um, our, our, our uh, friends from Baltimore, how, how to engage young people. So I think this is, this is a, a really key element. Um, so yeah, so I was gonna show you a couple of videos of different things that I use to kind of engage kids. So the next video, the, the video I'm gonna show now is a little video I show in like lesson two with, with kids or early on to show them how our kind of attention can wander, can kind of move around. Speak. Hi there. Look. Did that dog just say hi there? Oh yes. Bruh. My name is Doug. I have just met you and I love you. Uh. My master made me this collar. He is a good and smart master, and he made me this collar so that I may talk. Squirrel! <laughs> so, uh, so that really, that really gets the kids, you know, because especially in a primary school, you're in a primary school, and all the time, the squirrels here and there, you know, the kids are like, who's going to the classroom? What's happening with this? Should, so their attention's kind of pulled all over the place all the time. And if, if you're to, to say to a kid, you know, so when your attention wanders, bring it back, they're like, 
you know, <laughs> very good, you know what I mean? This sounds really boring. Where can it, there's something much more interesting. But you show that, they're like, oh, this is interesting, you know? And then so after, after we show that video, we play a game called Spot the Squirrel, where the kids do like three mini meditations, like about a minute, and they, had, they, they have to try and focus on the breath, and then they watch where their mind goes, what catches their attention. And also what I find helpful with, with younger kids, I do this with, the, with, the, with um, uh, young offenders as well, is, is for them to write down where their mind went. And I think the, the reason I find that little technique helpful is because um, to notice how your attention is wander, wandering is in itself quite a developed metacognitive ability. You know, like most of the time, like we can, we can, our mind can be wandering. We don't even know where we are. We're just kind of in a dwam, you know. And so sometimes if you, if you ask kids to just start practicing without making it really, really concrete, they can be like, yeah, I was on my breath. Where did you feel it? I don't know. You know, you think, actually they were thinking about their Xbox, you know, but they weren't even really that aware whether they're on their breath or not. So playing that little game, making it concrete can be really helpful. Um, and there's another video I'd like to show you in a minute. And uh, it's quite a long video. Um, but I wanted to show also because um, it, I, I find it quite a beautiful video and I think it's, uh, if this is one of your, your, your first kind of taste of mindfulness, it also gives you a sense of what's possible for mindfulness. Like, like the way that we relate, what this video is really about is the way that we look, the way that we see how we're in, we make contact with experience <laughs> has a big impact on our experience, you know? And so this is a video I show to the kids in about midway through the course when, I, when we're starting to explore how mindfulness can help us be in touch with the conditions for happiness that are available to available to us, how we can maybe enjoy things more. When I watch TV, it's just some shows that you just, that are pretend. And, and when you explore, you get more imagination than you already had. And um, when you get more imagination, it makes you want to go deeper in. So you can get more and see beautiful things. Like it could, the path, if it's a path, it could leave you. It could lead you to a beach or something, and it could be beautiful. You think this is just another day in your life? It's not just another day. It's the one day that is given to you today. It's given to you. It's a gift. It's the only gift that you have right now. And the only appropriate response is gratefulness. If you do nothing else but to cultivate that response to the great gift that this unique day is, if you learn to respond as if it were the first day in your life, and the very last day, then you will have spent this day very well. Begin by opening your eyes and be surprised that you have eyes you can open. That incredible array of colors that is constantly offered to us for pure enjoyment. Look at the sky. We so rarely look at the sky. We so rarely note how different it is from moment to moment with clouds coming and going. We just think of the weather. And even of the weather, we don't think of all the many nuances of weather. We just think of good weather and bad weather. This day, right now, it's unique weather. 
maybe a kind that will never exactly in that form come again. The formation of clouds in the sky will never be the same that is right now. Open your eyes, look at that. Look at the faces of people whom you meet. Each one has an incredible story behind their face. A story that you could never fully fathom. Not only their own story, but the story of their ancestors. We all go back so far. And in this present moment, on this day, all the people you meet, all that life from generations and from so many places all over the world, flows together and meets you here like a life-giving water if you only open your heart and drink. Open your heart to the incredible gifts that civilization gives to us. You flip a switch and there is electric light. You turn a faucet and there is warm water and cold water and drinkable water. It's a gift that millions and millions in the world will never experience. So these are just a few of an enormous number of gifts to which we can open your heart. And so I wish you that you will open your heart to all these blessings and let them flow through you. That everyone whom you will meet on this day will be blessed by you. Just by your eyes, by your smile, by your touch, just by your presence. Let the gratefulness overflow into blessing all around you. And then it will really be a good day. Yeah, so, um, nice video, isn't it? Um, yeah, so these are the, uh, these kind of ways of, of engaging young people and open their eyes to this stuff is, I think, uh, uh, there's a lot of, lot of potential with it, you know? Um, so this is, I just thought I'd show you um, quickly the, uh, the, the structure of the course that I do with, with young kids. So... In lesson one, we focus on intention. Uh, we focus on how the brain can grow and change, you know, how it's possible to train the mind. And then lesson two and three, we look at what is this fa faculty of attention, you know, we explore how the fact that our attention is like the window to the mind. Everything we experience comes through attention, you know. Um, and we learn that we can train it. Then we move on and we look at attitude and how that we can actually develop uh, a, a way of relating that's, that's, that's based on, um, first of all, one of them is curiosity, what's sometimes called the beginner's mind, really seeing things with fresh eyes, like, like that, that video showed there, that's lesson five. And lesson four, we, we look at the attitude of, of allowing, of, of letting things be, rather than kind of reacting or resisting experience, you know. Um, and then in lesson six, we look at willpower, diligence. What's interesting, when adults learn mindfulness, they usually try too hard. You know, they're usually like, I'm going to be really good at this. I'm going to mend my way, you know, you know. And kids kind of tend to like, oh, they're already, they're just like <laughs> sleeping. It's like, you know, that's the way they see it. So can we kids sometimes, it's kind of helpful to bring that balance. Okay, kids, let's, let's try and just, you know, a wee bit more uh, diligence, you know. Um, uh, and then lesson seven and eight, we look at, we look at gratitude, using that, the kind of stuff we saw there. Lessons 9 and 10, we look at resilience, how to use mindfulness to, to handle difficult emotions and also handle and recognize difficult or unhelpful thoughts, you know, and, and kind of be, um, recognize our own mind and, and maybe kind of relate to it a little bit more skillfully. 
Um, we also, in, in lessons 9 and 10, we play a game called uh, Mindful Musical Statues. So we, and I like to use Ghostbusters because Ghostbusters represents fear, you know? So the kids are dancing to Ghostbusters and then when the music stops, they stop. So they have to follow the breath. So, they try, so that they learn that when you have a strong emotion, you stop and you breathe, you know, you come down to the breath. So it's like, it's finding ways of, like that, you know, the, the important thing about these, the, the, the kind of first three elements there of intention, attention and attitude is that we don't leave these behind once we move on to the rest of the course, that they flow through. Like in terms of nourishing the kids' engagement and attention, that's still massive through all the lessons in terms of training attention to be present and seeing if we can be responsive rather than reactive in terms of our attitude. That still always is emphasized throughout, you know. So the fundamentals of mindfulness always kind of continue to come through. And then, by this time, the kids have become more familiar with their minds. You know, they're, they're becoming more familiar with how their minds operate. And, and, and then, so we look at um, kindness to themselves. And, and once they become, they, they recognize that they have this wish to be happy, they don't want to suffer, they start to cultivate kindness to themselves, then they also are able to then cultivate kindness to others. And we start looking at that and, and we do things like random acts of kindness and explore how kindness feels to us and how they can actually um, engage in acts of kindness, you know, and, and actually cultivate kindness through contemplative practices. So they actually practice sending um, friendly wishes. So they'll kind of sit over themselves with the breath, sell themselves with the body, and then they'll bring to mind somebody they care about, maybe a brother, a sister, or a pet, and then they'll just send a wish, may you be happy, may you be well. So they're kind of really, through, through thought, trying to tap into that kindness in the brain and, and really get that, 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 that neural pathway charged up, you know? Um, interestingly, just on these two parts, on, on gratitude and resilience, one teacher describes these as the art of happiness and the art of suffering. So it's how we can use mindfulness to be in touch with the experience in a way that's skillful, that we can nourish and recognize the conditions of happiness and then be wise and compassionate and the way we hold and embrace what's difficult, you know? Mindfulness is never about denying what's difficult or trying to be positive. It's about skillfully relating to what's actually in front of us, you know? And then finally, in the last two lessons, we, we kind of move towards looking at uh, purpose, looking back over the course, what they've learned and how they want to take this forward. Um, and I thought I'd got a little video um, of some kids talking about their experiences um, of, of having done the course. <laughs> I think mindfulness is really relaxing because it like calms you down in any situation that you're in and it just really helps. I think the most important thing I've learned is to not react at like every angle and just seeing and noticing like and allowing these kind of things to happen. Well mindfulness is like a journey into the mind and like you can really like make yourself more calm and like a better person. And like when I'm upset, it like calms me down and then I'm like, and then I feel a little bit better. And then when you take time to like focus uh, on like things around you, then you actually enjoy yourself more and then you realise like that stuff is there that you haven't realised before. Well, they help in like a way of using mindfulness. It's like you, you're aware of stuff and like say you're aware that somebody's like upset you would need to use kindness to like see if they're all right and like help them and stuff. Um, my favourite activity is probably the lying down activity because it's really relaxing and it calms you down a lot. So if everyone practised mindfulness in school, it would, no one would be as angry or calm, they would just enjoy school more. I think it's really important to just enjoy it and just enjoy the practice and don't just say oh no this is going to be another boring day but you never know it might not be it might be quite different than the usual <laughs> okay and we've actually got uh, a very kind uh, attendee today daniel do you want to call daniel and say a few words yeah can we give a round of applause to daniel <laughs> So, 
Daniel, I tell, uh, I don't need this mic. Why have I got this mic? Um, Daniel, I taught Daniel. When did I teach you? A year ago. A year, year ago. Okay. So you want to take that? Can you, you got that? Yeah. Cool. So yeah, it would be. I think it would be nice to hear, like, just what you thought of mindfulness. You want to tell everybody what you thought of mindfulness, or what you think of mindfulness. I think it's a really good way to calm people down in situations that they might not be able to like understand as well. Right, cool, cool, cool. And were there, um, what was it like when you all practiced together in your class? Uh, there were a few tempered ones in the class, but later on in the playground that really helped them out. Yeah, did you see it helping them? Yeah. And how, what was that like? A lot better. Yeah, yeah. Can you, did you notice any situations for yourself or anybody else? Not particularly Not for particularly. me. You just be just a general yeah. sense. Cool, cool, cool. And how, how did you did you enjoy practicing mindfulness? Yeah. Yeah. Cool. Is there anything else you'd like to add? No. Oh, done. <laughs> give me a five. Give me a high five. Fist bump. Okay. Cool, man. Thank you. Round of applause for Daniel. <laughs> Thanks, Daniel. <laughs> so. That's the, that's the program for, for kids, and I've been working on that for like about three, four, four years. Um, and we've now taught, to, taught this program to, um, I think probably more, more than a thousand kids have now have been through this program. I've, I've taught hundreds, and, and we, we, last year we did a training for, for, for teachers and, so, and educational ecologists. And so there's more kids across Scotland that are now learning this program. Maybe in Colombia as well, we had somebody from Colombia. So maybe it's, maybe it's out there. Um, another program we're working on, on is the, the teens program. And um, uh, one of the things we do with the kids, which is, is, a, is an ideal I, I, idea I totally stole from these guys, was when I saw that video, was the movement at the start. Like every lesson with the kids, I get the kids moving, you know, almost every lesson. So we get them moving, get some of that energy out so that then they can be still. And then what we'd also do with the kids is like a, almost every, every lesson we do a sit and practice and a lying down practice. Uh, so there's a lot of focus in the practice, but what I found with the teenagers is that teenagers are self-conscious, you know, 13, and you're asking them to like, right, breathe in like this and breathe out, and they're like, whoa, I'm not doing this. So there's, there's, a, there's a lot of differences with the, with the teen program, you know, uh, but there's also, there's also things that can be really interesting, like the discussion, like, can be, can be very rich in the, the, the inquiry, what's called the inquiry process in, in, in mindfulness to, to kind of tease into and inquire what was that practice like for you and where are you seeing that kind of unfold for you. That can be very rich with teenagers. Um, and the other thing that can be quite, can, can be a lot of fun is to, is to talk a little bit more than you can with the young kids about the brain science. So these kids are getting, wow, this is how my brains work, you know? Um, so, and, and also what, what I've done, decided to do with the teens program is, is follow the same structure as the kids program. So I think these are kind of foundational stuff, you know, how you handle suffering, how you can be in touch with, how you can hand, you know, cultivate gratitude, you know, how you can be kind. It doesn't really matter what age you're at, you know, you're eight or you're 80, it's, it's all useful stuff, isn't it? So these are just some stuff that teenagers have said. I'll just read these out just in case anybody has some difficulty seeing it. So everyone should be introduced to mindfulness because no one has a perfect life and mindfulness helps us to realize that and be with all of our feelings. So these are, this is like a 13 year old girl. Mindfulness sessions were a lot of fun and I like the fact that you can't get it wrong because you are, you're just noticing what is there in your mind. Mom and I don't argue so much now and if we do, we make up a whole lot quicker than before. That was me actually, that was <laughs> <laughs> uh, Mindfulness is fun to do, and I would have liked to do it for a whole year to get out of business studies. <laughs> so that's another benefit, you know? Uh, if you lose someone in your family, this is a wee boy who lost his mom about five or six months before the program. He says, if you lose someone in your family, mindfulness is a good way to help you cope rather than hitting out at people. And um, he, was, he was a um, beautiful wee guy, and, but, strong emotions, you know, and he would, he, it, was a, it was a challenge for him, like every class in school was a challenge for him, but uh, my, my sense is one thing that made that, the thing, the, the, that course be successful for him and, and, and for him to connect with it a bit was he, he and I had a good relationship. We, I, I kind of took a bit of time to try and connect with him, and I'll speak a little bit more in a moment about the work with um, uh, 
the young guys in Pullman in the jail and I think like relationship is so key to this, you know, so, so key. Um, I think the mindfulness changed me a bit and I think I can say what I want more. I think I'm more outgoing. So interesting, like Sahari was talking this morning about extroversion and how if we're more at ease in ourselves, we can be a bit more outgoing, you know? Um, I see a lot of angry people and I think mindfulness could help them too. <laughs> see, the wisdom of kids, sometimes it's so pithy, you know what I mean? We need a whole conference, you know what I mean? Kids just, you know. Um, the other thing I just wanted to shed some light on um, was Lindsay's work at the, at the um, college. Um, Lindsay's developed a, a, a course for young adults. Um, there's like, a, a, is it 10, 12 sessions, Lindsay? 12, 12 sessions, 12 weekly sessions, they're like hour long, and they're really focused on practice. Um, and this is the, this is the experience of, of one young guy who, who did the course. For a long, long time, between the ages of 14 and 20, I had a severe problem of anxiety. It started in school and grew to the point where it affected my exams, standard grades beyond everything was horrible and when I tried to go back into education it gradually got worse and I had to drop out of college and then my job, I had to leave my job as well. So it was severely affecting me. Um, I tried a lot of things. I tried prescriptions, I tried buying things off the internet that I probably shouldn't have and I tried putting myself in challenging social situations and none of those things had the effect that I wanted. Um, but you'll notice that I said those things only affected me till the age of 20. I am now 21 and mindfulness has made a significant change in how I'm able to go about my day-to-day -day business. My lecturers, two lecturers, have noticed, they've said there's been a huge difference in you since first year. My girlfriend's noticed. Um, the results are evident in my, my college work. I'm able to... Um, try and get more challenging interviews. I just feel that I've got more ambition and thing, more things are possible. I can't just settle for being unhappy. You know, things are possible if you um, attempt the mindfulness because I've been trying to do it every week, maybe just 10 minutes. And it's from the first session onwards, I've I just noticed something different in my general disposition. And I want to keep practicing mindfulness wherever I go in future. Okay, so I think we'll, um, thank you so much for your attention. We'll leave it there and uh, we'll take a, maybe a 10 minute break. Is that cool? Yeah.